All right, welcome back here to the Gill Athletics Connections Track and Field Podcast. I got too many words in that title. The Gill Podcast, you know where you're at. Hopefully, uh, if this is your first time, uh, boy, you have hit play on a doozy. Uh, you know, I, I'm recording with him right now, so I don't even know how it's going. We're going to go through this journey together. But we've got an amazing guest today, so you have picked the right first one. If this is your second, third, 50th, 100th, I mean, we're getting close to 200 episodes here now, so maybe you're getting close to 200 yourself. Welcome back, and just so, so grateful that you continue to press play on the Gill Podcast, and you know, really, it's all about the guest and their journey, and we've got a great one today here, so let's hop right into it. Longtime friend here for me, so this is going to be an absolute blast. Help me welcome Coach Extraordinaire. He's with MVA Training. We're going to learn about that as well, but help me welcome the wise, the wonderful Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, man. Welcome to the show. And thanks for being here, man. This is uh this is a treat for me. I, you know, there's some some real uh, special people to me, and you're one of them, Jeremy. So it's kind of fun to, you know, be able to share your journey with others and also just to kind of love on you, man, and just tell you how awesome you are. And you know, oh, thanks, I, man. And, and I mean, well, we you know, we've we've done it together. I mean, we, yeah. we I did coaching education in the very early Boise back in gosh, two thousand one or two or something like that. And you know, we 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 came up together. I remember when you were coaching at Ball State, so you'll always be a coach <laughs> in my eyes regardless oh, <laughs> hey i tell you that is something i struggle with a little bit here before we get into it jeremy um you know i have people uh i'm, I'm real big on twitter like that's kind of where i live you know people talk about the multiverse or the metaverse i, I just live on twitter that's where my life is right <laughs> and i will have people that will say hey great job coach or hey thanks for saying that coach and i get a little on edge about that because i'm not a coach anymore and i hold that title at such a high esteem like, I feel like it's almost like, oh, I'm actually, I'm taking away from people like Jeremy and Boo and Joel and Petros. Like, you know, it's a little, but it's it's so honorable that someone would still call me coach. You know, it's well, it's, I mean, it's weird because, for me. But it, it, it for, you can't take it away. It's like we we have an expression that uh, once an Olympian, always an Olympian. Mm. So there's no such thing as a former Olympian. You're an Olympian. It's the same thing as a coach. I mean, you affected people's lives while you were coaching. And so they'll always see you as coach. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about it, but I know you and I and, you know, every other uh, coach or athlete was affected by a coach sometime in their life. I mean, it could have been my, you know, sixth grade basketball coach or, you know, my sixth grade soccer coach, but they had positive effects in our lives. So they'll always be coach. And so I think, I think uh, it's a badge of honor. I, I know you respect it because you work with, but you, to me, that's where your beginning was, was a coach. So <laughs> you're, you're always a coach. <laughs> that, you know, that, that really helped me actually, Jeremy, because I mean, it, it's a little bit like, man, I, you know, that'd be like, if you called someone who's not a doctor, a doctor, and it's like that they didn't earn the title and um, maybe they're not a doctor anymore. So for me, it's so held such high esteem. Uh, so you saying that really, uh, that means a lot to me. Thank you for, for, for no, saying no, that. no. But I mean, you, you know, there are people you coach for how many years? And, you know, so you affected yeah. a lot of people, you know, yeah. and so they, they, they don't see you as, you know, Mike, the, you know, huge, big gill, you know, uh, <laughs> equipment provider, you know, for championships and everything yeah. else, you know, they, they see you as a, Hey, you know, Mike Cunningham, my, my track coach from yeah. you know, all state or even before that, wherever, you know, it was yeah. at. So, yeah. so I think, uh, yeah, you're once a coach, always a coach. I like that. That means a lot, man. Thank you. Well, speaking of that, let's get into your story here, Jeremy. Um, where does, you know, at, at some point, and usually I say, for for guests, I go uh, assuming you were an athlete, and we got to do I, I talk a little bit about your athleticism. You were an athlete, my friend. Holy cow, love that uh, part of your journey. Uh, but at some point, coaching switched in your mind. It became from something that was done to you. Hey, Jeremy, go jump this, go lift this. Somewhere along the way, it had to be like, oh, wait a minute, like I, I could be a coach. Like this could be my profession one day. Where does coaching begin for you? Yeah. Um... I didn't, it's kind of like, even with track, I mean, um, Mike, you talked about, it. I, I was a seven, four high jumper, was, you know, state champ in California, national champ, all that kind of stuff when I was in high school, senior year, but I started track not till my sophomore year, uh, my freshman year, I got hurt and then didn't get to really do it. And then sophomore year was really my first year of, of doing track. I didn't do mm -hmm. summer track and stuff. So I kind of got into it late and I, I wanted to be the next Michael Jordan, <laughs> you know, uh, my teams were the Chicago Bulls and, and the UNLV running rebels with Jerry Tarkanian, <laughs> you know, the players were like uh, Stacey Ogman and Larry Johnson and uh, those guys. And, and I wanted to be, uh, you know, like I wanted to go to UNLV, play basketball and, you know, uh, then go, 
playing the NBA, but I'm five <laughs> ten. Even though I could, you know, hit my head on the rim, uh, you know, I learned really quick that uh, there's guys who can jump just as high as I can, and they're six five. Yeah, there, there's not many Muggsy Bogues in this world. No, not that you were that short, all. but there ain't that many yeah. people that overcome that. But, right. but Muggsy Bogues always is very strong, and I was probably 125 pounds, you know, uh, soaking <laughs> wet. And so uh, I just – that body frame never was going to work. And so just, you know, you gravitate to areas where um, you have success. And so I jumped they set six eleven three quarters my sophomore first year, and then I jumped seven two as a junior and seven four as a senior. So – it track became kind of that thing, but like if if you ask me, probably through college, I want I still love basketball, and you know, and it ended up being kind of a sore spot for me because I kept trying to play intramural basketball and all that kind of stuff, and and you know, even at NCAA's, the basketball games and the dunk contest, the high jumpers would have like literally we didn't care about the high jump contest. I mean, it was important, but we wanted to play a basketball game, and we all got together at every NCAA. Is like, that right? Yeah. So, I mean, Eric Bishop, uh, Shane Levy, Nathan Leeper, myself, I mean, everybody, we all, we played this epic game where there's the most epic dunks and craziness. And you so. Know, I, I like that. Like that's the sub history. No one, unless they were involved knows, you, you yeah. know, like the, uh, the infamous, um, you know, after track social, like just most people just don't know about those kind of aspects. So yeah. is this kind of a, was it a tradition that was before you or did you guys kind of start this? Before, yeah, it was, I think it was before me, yeah. but it was kind of like we started talking and it was like, okay, where's the game? And some of the long jumpers would show up, some of the sprint, whoever loved basketball. Yeah. And we'd find a place to play, whether it was a local YMCA or whatever, that was close to wherever NCAAs was. And, you know, it was crazy because you'd have a guy who basically jumped like 6'11 and didn't do very well, who was a 7'5 high jumper. And then he'd play the game and you're like, how did you only jump six eleven? Because he's, you know, almost like literally hitting his head on the rim and you know stuff like that. And we're just, it was hilarious and it was epic. And it almost became like that was a thing to look forward to mm. at NCAA's because it was like okay, the season's over mm. from a college standpoint. So it was like the first time, literally. Some of them, you know, you talk to Nathan and Shane; they played basketball during the season. Even even uh, Jesse um, mm. Williams, he, you know, he was always playing basketball that was his mm. issue right um but uh you know yeah we, we it was for some of us it's like i hadn't played basketball in mm. six months so it was like oh man i get to play now and if i get hurt it doesn't matter <laughs> coach really can't say point. nothing coach yeah exactly <laughs> exactly i just scored points or finished whatever so let's go do this and you, so you, you know you went to a really great university i've become really good friends with some of the support staff and uh, coaches there at uw and have come, gone to some of the bigger cross country meets up there uh yeah. really i mean beautiful campus beautiful school did you ever contemplate trying out for the basketball team there no, I'm not. I wasn't that good. Yeah, I mean, just, I can. Yeah. I was. I just wasn't. You know, the biggest thing about college is the physicality. Mm. And I wasn't a physical player. I was a finesse player. And 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 quite frankly, like I didn't even play my senior year. I gave it up because I signed the scholarship with Wisconsin mm -hmm. and uh, chose to go there. And so, um, again, I was late. You know, kind of getting you get sidetracked because your question is how do we get into <laughs> this? But uh, yeah, yeah. But, that's right. <laughs> I started, I really started track late. And then, you know, even uh, at Wisconsin, it was like, you know, we'd won the triple crown pretty mm -hmm. much every year. I was there. We mm -hmm. finished fourth at NCAAs. Right. Um, I'd finished, you know, runner up at NCAAs and however many other time All American. I don't even know. And that was when All America was only top six. You know, it wasn't even top eight. Oh, is that right? Oh, wow. Yeah, it was only top six. And you got a trophy or a little plaque if you were top six. And that's the huh. only. Well, yeah so it's crazy how much it's changed mm -hmm. and how you know how great like the USTF CCCA has done for the mm -hmm. sport because yes. you know back then you know there was no second team all-american right all of that so um, it was you finish top six and you get a trophy and then you're all-american or you're not <laughs> you know I kind of yeah. like that you know I like that cutthroat like man there's only six but then yeah, yeah no yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was it was cutthroat and, and there was no ineligibility thing so like uh, you know, I remember jumping against athletes and they hadn't been to class all the semester, <laughs> but, but you, they didn't cut you until they didn't get you ineligible until like the summertime. Right. You could still compete at NCAA. So there wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to pull you before regionals or I'm going to pull you before right. whatever. So I remember competing against, I won't put his name out. Yeah. Yeah. So don't name this. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm sitting there going, man, I just finished my, you know, I did a double major in 
molecular biology and nutritional science. And I'm sitting there like, you know, struggling because I had a senior thesis and I was like, oh, I remember getting it done. And then, you know, getting on a plane to uh, NCAA, I think it was in Indi or no, I think we drove to Indianapolis in, in 90s. And I think we finished fourth, and, but I had a terrible meet because I was just so stressed out about my finals because then I would start grad school the next year. And I'm talking to, you know, the guy, you know, one of the kids, I think uh, the Texas guy, he won. Ivan Wagner came out of nowhere and won, oh, jumped yeah. like 230. And it was impressive because it was like 60 degrees. And yeah. um, one of the athletes who was top three, though, he's like, yeah, I, I just play basketball. You know, I go to practice. I have been in class <laughs> in the whole semester. And I'm like, you know. So it was just it was different. <laughs> so you just mentioned you you this is amazing. And I and I knew this. I couldn't remember the exact major, but I knew you took a major that I could barely spell. Uh <laughs> molecular biology and you say nutrition science? Yeah, nutrition science. What was your thought process going into college to study those? Were you thinking of going to become a coach or was it a no, scientist no, or no, I don't know, what no, I was I I since the age of like six or seven, I knew I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Really? So it's kind of funny to sit there. I, I'm so amazed at all the people I graduated school with. Like, I just, um, we'll get into it later, but I just, you know, walk USATF and we're not, I'm not working for them anymore. So for the last 12 years, I was the director of the residence program. And so we, right. you know, stopped doing that on September. It'd be the last day of September this, this year. And so, um, so up until that, I was the uh, director of that. So I had one of my teammates who was like, like, you know, he's, he's a, a Supreme court judge in the state of Wisconsin who helped me, but it's just amazing. Cause like, you know, I have a roommate who is uh, a orthopedic surgeon and a, uh, has a PhD in biomedical engineering. I have my other roommate. Uh, he's a cardiologist at the Mayo clinic. Um, one uh, teammate before he's the head of radiology at university of Wisconsin, Madison. And so Holy cow. people, yeah, no, I went to school with some un, unbelievable intelligent minds and stuff like that it was like a perfect example i think i was taking an organic chem or something and, and they couldn't find a tutor because it was such a high level class so i actually had one of my teammates tutor me I, I i got it set up so that he he could get paid to help me you know with my class and so um i went i mean that's kind of why i went to wisconsin was academics besides mm -hmm. that i mean we were very successful like i said one you know we literally won the triple crown every year i was there right. and uh and then finished fourth at NCAAs mm -hmm. as a team and um but I went there for pre we don't have pre-med so it was more mm -hmm. just like the medical track and, mm -hmm. and kind of through it you know and through the process and doing everything that was supposed to kind of go you know I um I had a lot of different offers I mean it's crazy like you know I had a you know summer intern with Pfizer so I was offered a you know very well-paying job they had like this uh minority leadership thing through Pfizer and then um like even like I was helping one of my roommates and one of my best friends to this day, he uh, was the manager for basketball. And so when I was going to get my masters, even like, uh, so you'll love this Dick Bennett. Uh, he was, he was the coach and his son uh, uh, now is at Virginia. Um, I forget his first name, but anyway, they just won the national championship a few years ago and he was assistant and they were like, well, you know, maybe you want to be a GA for basketball, you know, or something like that. And so I had weird kind of different offers, but um, by then I kind of was like pretty much set, you know, just I'm, I'm going to go to med school, do all this. Um, and then I went out for track because I, I was there, I was getting another master's. I was, you know, um, kind of training for the trials in 2000. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, why don't you come out and help track, you know? And, and so I got to work with Jerry Schumacher. And I got to be his GA for, you know, cross country and stuff like that. And obviously in the, in the fall and I traveled with the cross country team and, you know, drove the buses and, you know, or the vans and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Jerry was amazing to me and just watching his success right on. It was like, wow, you know, unbelievable. And yeah, I mean, obviously he's now the director of track and field at Oregon and the Bowman track club is one of the most successful programs. And uh, uh, so then I, um, you know, it was like, okay, well, well, let me try this track thing. And it was kind of that late thing of like high jumping where it was late. I, hmm. I got into it and I was like, oh, I love this and I'm great at it. And, but because of my, you know, uh, knees thirst for knowledge, I, you know, went, that's when I, you know, was like, okay, I need to do coaching education. I need to learn something else besides the Wisconsin way to do things. Mm -hmm. 
And well, so that was the level of coaching, education, and everything else. I mean, it's quite interesting because, you know, the the track that you kind of had set yourself on since six years old, by the way, uh, was to do this amazing thing, you know, become a surgeon. I mean, there, I mean, good golly. <laughs> That's just, just amazing. Right. I mean, who has the skill set for that? A very, very small percentile of people that, uh, have the passion to do it and then can actually go out and do the education and, and the experience part of it. What was it? So you're on this high level track, these internships are in front of you and you go help out the, the cross country team, which I thought was interesting. Not necessarily, you, you didn't mention the track team. You're talking about the cross country team. What yeah. was it about coaching that was like, oh, maybe I should give this a, a try? It just, you know, it was one of those things almost like it felt like a, you know, comfortable pair of shoes. It just fit, you know, hmm. fit really well. And then it was, but then I knew the limitations of my ability. So I knew that, like, I don't really know a lot about, I mean, I can tell you the the macro, micro, all that kind of stuff about the cellular development and everything else, but I don't know much. I mean, I took, what, one physiology class. I never took an exercise physics class. I never, I mean, I took physics, but I never took a biomechanics class. So I sat there and was like, I, I need to know more about this. And so, you know, Ed Nuttycomb, who, uh, mm -hmm. who was, you know, most winning coach and, you know, Ed's amazing in the hall of fame and everything. He's, uh, you know, he, I remember his quote, don't get into coaching for the money. You're going <laughs> to literally like you're, 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 if you want to be a doctor, you're going to make, you know, however much you make. And, um, if you be a track coach, you're going to make, you'll never make six figures. <laughs> that was his quote hmm. and how things have changed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so for me, it was like, I was like, you know what though, I rather make, fifty sixty thousand dollars as a limit but enjoy my job every day mm -hmm. um and instead of you know doing something where and i talked to my friends you know cardiologists or the people they, they hate it they some of them are out of it they found other ways to get out of it and some wow. of them you know kind of whatever and not to put their business out you know we're talking about multiple marriages mm -hmm. you know just yeah they have money but it it it's they don't enjoy their job or right. they found another avenue to do their job that's not practical so so you know i think i definitely i never have a case of the mondays you know it's like <laughs> you, you know we always say if you do something you love you never work a professional day of your life mm -hmm. i have done plenty of jobs that don't allow you know that are jobs mm -hmm. and but professionally yeah i haven't worked you know a single day and so from that point on i knew okay i want to be a coach i love this um and you know and it, it allowed me to train through you know 2000 mm -hmm. I think I finished seventh at trials, had a terrible competition, but, uh, you know, I ended up jumping, you know, seven, six that year. And, and then it's kind of like, okay, I want to do this coaching thing. So then that's when I took the job at Northridge and Cal State Northridge. And, and I was actually supposed to only be um, like a GA and they just threw me in, you know, with the, with the Sharks. I'm 24 years old. I'm coaching 23 year olds, you know, and, and, I, but I was like, okay, I'm going to get a master's in exercise phys and my mechanics. And so, it, you know, we had this conversation earlier. I remember listening to Dan Path, um, and he was co teaching level three, and I was in my second year of getting my master's. And Dan talked, and I was like, "This guy needs to teach my my, my <laughs> degree because I don't understand half of what he said." You know, and and uh, it was amazing, and I was just so, uh, you know, I've been I'm opposite of most people. I'm not a you know poo poo guy. I'm a guy who who loves new information, even mm -hmm. different information, even information that's not the norm. And so um, even for myself, I probably made decisions that were like, uh, I don't want to, I kind of want to create my own path mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so the Northridge was a great time. I mean, I made mistakes, you know, I made mistakes as a coach. I made them technically, I made them from a, a kind of whatever, but I had, you know, Don Stramitz, another mm -hmm. USTCCA Hall of Fame. He allowed me to really grow while I was there and make mistakes and, and learn. I, I wasn't, you know, like, okay, hey, go take the job at Florida as a young coach, make mistakes, and then you get fired. It was more <laughs> like make mistakes and learn and really build your craft. And so for four years when I was at Northridge, I was getting all my certifications. I got my level three from, U, from uh, USATF. I got my CSCS while I was there. I got my USA weightlifting certification. So even though they didn't pay me, really that well they did pay for all my certifications mm. and at the time i got to work with jeff mccauley who ended up being a very successful college yeah. coach glenn mcatee who i mm. argue is one of the most 
it's a shame he's not in college. He's one of the smartest humans I've ever met. Like he's, he is, he's brilliant, you know? And, and, and I, he really like kind of took me under his wing while I was there. And, and I learned a lot because I mean, he basically like he has masters and all that kind of stuff, but um, yeah, he's, he's, he's a very like uh, good X's and O's guys. And so I learned a lot from him while I was there. Well, let's, let's stay right there at Northridge real quick. Um, Jeremy, what I'm interested in, it's, it's interesting the way you talked about coaching track and field and like this challenge of like, oh, I need to learn more about it. Like it felt like it sounded like it sounds like you kind of see a challenge and you, you like to go learn it, kind of take it heads on, whether you can do it or not right today. It, it, that's not going to stop you. Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, even we'll talk a little bit about it with my own online business and all that kind of stuff. I during COVID, I literally took classes to create an online business and mm. learn about making my own website and doing mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so for me, it's always like, okay, if I don't know something, I will talk to people who know more mm -hmm. about it. And I will also read up and, and study it. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the end of the day, I think really what as coaches, we are teachers and some are, are more in the teaching aspect than others. And so I definitely, you know, teaching is probably at the forefront of my coaching right and so you know i went from learning this stuff to then you know if you look i, I re helped rewrite the coaching education <laughs> right. from level one and then i just got finished last uh winter rewriting level three for iaaf for the horizontal jumps and wow. so um you know it was also one of those things you know you talk to boo and it's like hey what can i do and boo's like just get back to the sport mm. and so that's the thing that i've been you know, kind of doing and stuff like that. But, you know, then there's a time where now I'm like, okay, I've given back the sport. I've given back now. I got to, you know, start taking care yeah. of myself and things like that. But Northridge was a fantastic time. I think, you know, it was cool because I was at Wisconsin, which is a power five and has, you know, mm -hmm. endless amounts of support to Northridge where, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't even want to know what our budget was, but it was really amazing on how the creativity started to flow mm -hmm. and because, when you don't have the money or the uh, you know shop to make plow boxes, mm -hmm. you go and you make them. Mm -hmm. So I made ramps, I made plyo boxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I spent so many you know I'm getting a master's, I'm coaching it, <laughs> and I'm teaching classes in the kinesiology department. But um, um, I literally spent all, a lot of free weekends building stuff. So plyo boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we built, I remember Glenn and I, we built the base, um, for these. We built the, uh, space support out of wood and, and fencing and stuff like that. So that it would stay off the ground and not get <laughs> wet and things like that. And so we spent so much time, like, at, at Northridge, you built you, the creativity was. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, and, and you were coached by a, a superb high level coach out there. One of, one of these guys that kind of can coach it all, Mark Napier. Yeah. But as an athlete, you know, it's it's a little different because there's you're not necessarily now you might have because of your kind of bend towards education and learning, not necessarily just doing what coach tells me. I want to kind of know why you know, I'm doing this. But how did you find the transition? You, you go from athlete and you're still an athlete in regards to your training for the trials and, and USAs and things like that. But now you're in charge of a group. So now instead of you going out and doing the high jump drills and speed and acceleration drills, now you're programming. How did you find that transition? transition and what it, what maybe you struggled with uh, as you first started writing programmatically I, I think it I think it was the level of the athlete and the individuality of the athlete. I think a Wisconsin kid mm -hmm. you train different than you would train a kid at a Cal State Northridge because we didn't really emphasize indoors because mm -hmm. uh, we competed like MPSF and I think even at Northridge you know we really like you know from where we were there I think we were really good at conference level team till then we became kind of a national level kind of you know mm -hmm. on that step kind of kid i mean you know even though he he you know and, and he i coached the national champion my second year high jumper and then he got busted for weed after and uh but you know he's still on that day won the high jump you know but it wasn't performance enhancing but it was a right. lesson to learn as a coach of like wow this 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 you know it was kind of crazy and then years later Deshaun andrews won the long jump and then shortly after that um 
had a um another national champion um, i'm forgetting his name right now but you know you from from a program where literally when i got there it was like oh don't recruit these people they'll never come to mm -hmm. not only getting them and then having kids you know to build that and, and i take you know a lot of uh uh, pride in that that every program we went to we won so when I mm -hmm. went as an athlete to Wisconsin we hadn't won a conference championship in however many years and we won is that right oh wow I mean it was it was a while it was probably the 80s and then we won basically you know from that point we won three out of four and then there was a class that I helped recruit while I was a GA there that won four out of four wow and, and won the national indoor championship and mm -hmm. so it was really that. cool to be a part of that. And then at Northridge, you know, we kind of won conference here or there to pretty much we dominated the conference and mm -hmm. then started having that we had the most national qualifiers that we ever had. And, and wow. uh, you know, from a team that had won Darcy Ariola, I think she was like a national champion D2 way back in the day. And, and you know, we had some good people way back in the 60s and 70s because you look at the Northridge tree. I mean, you got Art Benegas and mm. uh coach frazier you have uh That's right. John frazier, you have uh um bobby kersey you know i mean little thing people don't know is uh you know that Flo florence uh griffith she went to northridge before she transferred to ucla so she's her she's is that partner. right valerie briscoe hooks was in, is in, as it was a freshman and then bobby got the job at ucla and they all transferred but it was D2. Wow. Yeah. So even the coaching tree is amazing at, you know, Northridge. I mean, you had, uh, uh, who was the longtime coach at Tennessee when they were winning national championships when, uh, when not, uh, not Bill. Yeah. Lost Bill uh, Webb. Well, Webb, Webb. Yeah. 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 Bill Webb was at Northridge. So it's, it's, <laughs> it, you go back, uh, you know, Jeff Perkins at Irvine, you know, you just go back, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dale Cowper at Louisville. Um, Oh, Lemon. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, even Raina had a cup of coffee, uh, writer at, at you know. so you just, it, it's crazy to see how many coaches, you know, came through kind of the Northridge thing. And mm. so, um, you know, John Degata, who I work with, mm. at the time I did, he was, he was Northridge grad. So, um, you know, Avery Anderson, he was, he was, he got his first mm -hmm. coaching job at, at, at Northridge. So there's a big, uh, kind of coaching tree from Northridge and, and, there's a talented athletes. I mean, in Northridge, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, Wisconsin, I was kind of back in the day, you could do recruiting a little bit as a GA and stuff. And um, it's crazy how much rules have changed now. But now at Northridge, it was like all the kids live within two hours of campus. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we got a couple, we got a kid here and there from Colorado or Arizona or something like that. But uh, most of the kids were there. And then Glenn, I think had some connections with Canada. So we mm -hmm. get kind of, kind of get kids there from time to time. But and Northridge was amazing and, and it really grew. And, and my commitment was I'm honorable and, I, and I'm committed. So I, I told myself, even though I finished my master's after two years or two and a half years, I made sure I stayed there for mm. four years. I wanted one whole like coaching. You know, you're, you're not that far removed from having one toe into the going to medical school route. Did this time at Northridge solidify like, oh yeah, th this is actually why I was put here on earth. I, I'm supposed to be a coach. I think the first two weeks of, of going out to coaching, it just felt so oh, wow. comfortable and, and it just felt energized. Like I just felt this energy. I felt, you know, it was like sitting there studying for four or five hours. Cause I, I'll, I'll tell myself I'm intelligent, but I'm not like super gifted. I'm not one of those people who can sit there and read something one time and then regurgitate everything. You know, it, it takes me a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I can retain it, but it takes me longer. I do have to study. I have mm -hmm. to work at what I do. And so, um, but like coaching, like I'd go and, and I'd go to coaching and someone would tell me something and it's like, it just stuck. Or I, or I would look at something and, and I'd be like, well, what about doing it this way? And it mm. just was almost like, you know, kind of like, uh, wow, that's, that's a good way to think of it. You know, mm. that's, that's creative. And so I think uh, that was, and that's kind of what you know, I looked at, and then I took things from my own career and said, this is what I liked about my career. And this is things I didn't like. Hmm. So let me incorporate this and have that little bit of influence on it. But it was one of those things of just like, you know, I go back, Vern get better, right? Yeah. And Vern was about progression. And that was probably one of the big things I really, really, really took away um, from him was that progressionary thing and doing hmm. things that, you know, make sense. So my rule to thumb always is, if 
we're doing something and I can't tell you why we're doing it, you don't have to do it. Mm, interesting. Because everything needs to build to a, you know, a bigger platform or whatever it needs to go to. Well, I love, you know, it's, I'd say it's rare in, in life that we find the thing that we were put on earth for and actually find it to go into, right? Like there's, I think there's a, uh, amazing football players that actually were supposed to be doctors. In fact, in fact, what's the the guy who went to Florida State? Um, yeah, Millen I, Millen Roll. I'm sure. I'm, yeah, I'm, and Roll. Yeah. Roll. Yeah, I mean the guy was you know a, a Rhodes Scholar, and it's like, oh, thank goodness he found that because he could have just been playing the NFL. Which no shame on that, but he's gonna he's making medical history. He's helping in the medical field. So we we it's hard for us to sometimes find for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that you know you had and have the ability to become a doctor, but thank goodness you also be had the ability to high jump at a high enough level that you could go to a Wisconsin and find this coaching path as well. You, you could have been a six, two, six, three high jumper, which, Hey, that's still, I thought I can't jump one foot two, one foot three. Right. Yeah. Uh, and never got into that coaching side of it and been a doctor, which again is noble, but it's, you were put on this earth to be a coach. And so, you know, in that, that first taste, that was first two weeks, it was like, Oh my, wh where has this been? Like, this is, where I'm, I'm here. So how, where, where did uh, you, you go through Northridge and you did an amazing job with the, you know, and the crew you guys had there with coachings were just fantastic. Uh, what was the next step? How did, now that you, okay, I'm a coach. What was the kind of the next progression? And what was your thought in regards to coaching as far as a, a career? Yeah. You know, and, and so I, I definitely was into coaching actually, and it was crazy. So at Northridge, you had to learn how to survive. Right. And so um, and that's not, you know, kind of it. I mean, all of us have spent, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars giving back to the sport in different ways. Um, you know, uh, it, it, whether it's equipment or, you know, just different ways you find ways. And so at the end of the day, it was funny. I remember my last year at Northridge, I was paid 40 grand and that's mm -hmm. like 2004 or five. That's a lot of money you know, for a guy who I think my first year there, I made $2,000, <laughs> you know, and, um, but what happened was I actually started training on the side, like some like actors and some like athletes and stuff, because that's the connection you have uh -huh. in there. And so it was interesting from that standpoint, because I started to see kind of a new light of things. And so I, you know, I got all my certifications that I wanted to do. And because it was kind of lucrative from a cash standpoint, you know, it was almost like I was not quite double that, but, you know, I was probably making, you know, seven seventy five thousand mm dollars $75,000. And so I had a great life. I was living in Southern California, you know, 45 minutes from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately what happened was my mom passed away when I was there. And it was kind of one of the, I, you know, my story, I was adopted. I was mm -hmm. a son of a military man and, in, in Korea and I'm half Korean and stuff like that. So I think that's another kind of avenue for me where I always feel humbled by everything because I could be homeless in Korea, you mm -hmm. know, or, something, or whatever. And so um, when my adopted mom had passed away, I think it was kind of one of those times, it was like the perfect time to leave almost. It was like, mm -hmm. I kind of wanted a new experience uh, emotionally, obviously her and I were so close. And so it was kind of that, all right, I've done this smaller kind of thing. I got a few, I've got quite a few offers when I was at Northridge because of, you know, the success we had. But I, again, I, I wanted to be there for four years and um, I was leaving good athletes, but, you know, it was one of those things where you're always going to leave great athletes. Um, and so I decided, you know, Martin Smith, I knew him because he was at Wisconsin with me. And, That's and, right, yeah. And, and I really liked the fact that Oklahoma's jumps didn't, hadn't, been established um i i liked our facility i thought they were kind of a sleeping giant kind of thing and i thought oh, okay we could do some really cool stuff and so i took the job at at oklahoma and you know and the rest is history there you know had you know national champions you, you know we hadn't won a conference championship in 20 something years we won two while i was there the women had done absolutely zero zip zilch and you know the, the class they ended up finishing fourth at nationals you know and stuff and you know, there I got to work with Dana Boone. Um, I got to work with, uh, um, I actually got to help recruit Jeremy Sudbury. <laughs> um, who's Is now that right? I would say, yeah, because he he was uh, a junior college kid, I think from, 
uh, Arizona, I believe, <laughs> or I forget, but yeah, I was there when Jeremy was there and it's pretty cool to see him kind of how successful he is. And then, yeah. um, you know, Bobby, um, what's Bobby's last name? He's a Wisconsin guy and he was at, I don't even know where Bob was. He at, is he at Cal right now? Um, uh, I forget Bobby's last name, but you know, he, a distance guy. Yeah, just Lock, uh, not Lockhart. Lockhart, yeah, yeah. Bobby Lockhart. Mm -hmm. And so he even lived with me <laughs> while I was there. And then obviously we're with Martin. Mark Napier was there. Jeff Perkins, uh, Dana Boone. Uh, um, uh, gosh, I, I'm forgetting. Oh, and and uh, Brian Blutrick. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And so it was just it was uh, a time of like a realization of uh, okay, this is kind of cool because now we're at the national level. We have mm. the support we have that and you know yeah to win a couple of big 12 championships you know get a trophy at nationals uh to sit there and be able to be a part of that that was my kind of takeoff point i mean at one time gosh we, the triple jump group you know even before will was there uh, mm -hmm. we were a big catalyst on winning our first championship I and mean, we mm -hmm. had two scores in long jump you know a score in the high jump two and we went one two or one two at six and five or something like that in the triple jump wow. and uh you know, had multiple vaulters, Catholics, everything. And so it was a fun time. It was a time for, I learned a lot. Um, and I also learned kind of that the old college system wasn't for me, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so after about the fifth year, I just was like, I, I was spending, I was a recruiting coordinator. So I was working with football and track and, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there going like, gosh, we're not really we got, you know, eight hours and then we got 20 hours and it was really hard to mm. do kind of what I wanted to do in that time. And, you know, NCAA rules, I want to get into the mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, was ridiculous back in the day. But uh, um, my dad got really sick after five years and it was just time to go. And I'm a, I'm a Southern California guy and no yeah. offense to Norman, Oklahoma, but being a single guy in Norman, Oklahoma, it just wasn't for me. And, and, uh, you know, I came back, no job, <laughs> you know, and people offered, I got offers and people wanted me to go there, but I was just like, you know, I'm going to go home and take care of my dad. I had some NFL and major league baseball guys I was working with. Um, and, you know, really was like, okay, I'm going to spend this time, you know, taking care of my family, my awesome. dad was specifically. Well, let's, so, let, let's pause right there for a second, Jeremy, because a couple of things you brought up that we, we need to discuss a little bit further. First of all, I'd be remiss if going back to when you're at Northridge, how you and I actually met. So yeah. uh, you, you've heard me, if you listen to the podcast at all, you've hopefully listened to the Boo Sheck Snyder podcast. Again, number one podcast we've had. So if you haven't listened to it, press pause here, go listen to it because it's well worth it. And we're going to bring up something that Boo said based on what Jeremy said here in a second. But uh, so it was 20, it was right in the middle when I was in uh, at Ball State. So I was there two, 02 and 03. So it would have been the summer of 02. Two? Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I think my certification says 02. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I drove out from Muncie, Indiana to Ball, or to uh, Boise State, beautiful campus, by the way, uh, to do jumps. And it's funny because I was reluctantly to do jumps because I was a sprints hurdles coach. So I was supposed to take sprints hurdles and Mike Korn says, Hey, I'm sorry, it's full, but we got a position in the jumps and you'll get a lot out of it. And I was like, oh, I, get, I have to coach jumps here at ball state. So I guess I'll do it. Thank good. I mean, like you talk about things that just, you know, I, I thought it was the worst thing in the world because I wasn't going to do sprints and hurdles, but oh my gosh, it was the best thing ever. I did jumps. And in the jumps, you you were there as well. Uh, there was this guinea pig. Uh, every time Boo, who was teaching, wanted to show, you know, we'd go out to the track and he wanted to show hop progressions or single leg jump progressions. It was like, hey, Jeremy, uh, get over here and show us <laughs> X, Y, and Z. And you were, I mean, you had a heck of a workout that week, my friend, because you did it all. But what an amazing time with Boo as a teacher, and I think uh, Ron and Cabo were helpers. I think uh, they were kind of you know learning to teach, so they were they were helping out. Uh, it was just a fantastic time for coaching Ed and for track in general. And you were right there at the. I mean, you were a young pup. You were you know you were still jumping for crying out loud yeah, uh, yeah, during was, that time. Yep, I, I still was like 25, 26, still yeah. kind of training, and and yeah, it was funny. Todd Lane was in there too, so yeah, I knew was I was missing a name. Up. Yep, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so like I just you know I remember. Uh, you know, all of us coming up and together and to see, you know, the different coaches at different places is, 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 is pretty, is pretty amazing. And so, uh, yeah, no, that Boise state, uh, it was crazy because, uh, we drove up from, uh, 
from Southern California, me and uh, Glenn McAtee. And yeah. we had misinformation, Glenn and I had misinformation. So we're sitting there and we got there and we're just like, we went up to do some fishing <laughs> too. <laughs> so I'm sitting there out on the river and I, we see a coach and, and the coach goes, hey, you know, what's up? What are you? And then we're here for the coaching ad. He's like, yeah, it started, you know, today. And we're like, what? <laughs> and he was an alumni. So he didn't have to do oh, right, right. the thing until like the next day, but I was supposed to be in class. <laughs> and so I showed up and I'm like, boo, I'm so sorry. Like it was a misinformation. I thought, you know, whatever. And he's like, all right, just make up for it. Kind of whatever, <laughs> you know, and now, now you, you, when I ask you to do something, you got to do it. <laughs> so I was kind of at his thing. Either miss, uh, this makes so much more sense now. <laughs> yeah. So. So there, you know, so that he, I was like, here's like, the most, yeah, your help. here's the most non slacker person in the world slacker. Cause you're out fishing. That's great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And so we didn't know I mean, it was just because Glenn was an alum. So, you know, alum started later <laughs> in the week. And so Boo's like, well, when I ask you for help, you got to help. And I'm like, oh, Any, anything, you need, anything you need. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, something that you said that kind of sparked a memory from Boo's uh, episode with us back in um, late 2021 is he talked about, you, you mentioned about when you leave, you're talking about leaving Northridge uh, and even, you know, when, when uh, you, the time was up at Oklahoma as well, that, you know, you're, you're always going to leave athletes, good athletes or athletes you see a lot of potential in. And that gets some people hung up sometimes, right? And Boo had an, a really amazing, like, like when he said this, I'm going to quote it here in a second, but when he said it, I looked at him and I was like, oh, Boo, you're not supposed to say that. Meaning like, you know, that, that's, that hurts like yeah. people when you say it like this. And so what Boo was talking about, because we were talking about coaching as a profession and uh, always working to get more pay, not that money is the be all end all, but you, you have family and hobbies and you want to retire one day and things like that. And so he was really riffing on this part of it because he has such great experience here. And he said about, you know, leaving athletes and, you know, uh, I'm the best at, uh, coach for them. He goes, well, how do you know if you really are supposed to be doing everything for the athlete? How do you know you leaving a better coach won't come in for them? Yeah. And, that, and that's where I was like, oh, you're not, you know, you're not supposed to say that. Like we don't, we're not supposed yeah. to say another yeah. coach could actually be better for our athletes. But, you know, that humility that he has, like I might not be the best coach for this person, you got to kind of think about that as you're working towards your uh, career that, Hey, it's okay. There's always going to be athletes and maybe the next coach is better for them. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I've learned, you know, later just because I've had success with the athletes I've had doesn't necessarily mean that I'd be successful across the board. And, you know, I mean, I'll say it like some of the things um, I did that were kind of like, if I look back and some of the mistakes I made in my hmm. professional later career was, I'd come off this hot year where, you know, we had an amazing year and then I would take two or three more athletes and it took away from the quality of the work that I did. Mm. And so it ended up almost like kind of a, um, you know, the tide went down mm. because of the fact that, um, you know, first of all, you know, coaching like a Will or Brittany or, or a Wu or, you know, whoever I could kind of work with they're a 1% of the 1%, yeah. you know, so what they do is, is, is different. And then, you know, having, uh, you know, athletes that come in, it's like, okay, wait a minute, you're not really getting paid by them. And they're not, even if you get them to a certain level, it's not helping you. Right. And I hate to be cold and chalice like that, but you also have a job to those high level athletes to make sure that they're taken care of. And, Every person that you bring in that takes time away from them mm. can be, you know, that. And hey, I've had success. I've had success. I've had great athletes, but it, I don't necessarily, was I the best coach or was I this the best situation mm. for them? And was it fair to my other athletes by bringing them in too? And so, um, and that was, you know, the college thing. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything against college. It wasn't anything like that. It was really more of a personal, mm -hmm. I want to take care of my family kind of thing. It was a good transition kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of took off from there. And that's when I really feel like, it's like if, if, if I have levels of coaching, it was like, okay, um, 
I started coaching and I did things. I went to my level two and did, remember we had to do three level twos and then write a thing. Yeah, yeah. And I hate putting this out here, but I'm a, I'm a tell Mike Court. I, I wrote the thing and then they made the transition and that whole thing with USATF and USTFCCA went through. Oh, and I never yeah. got my level three certification. I mean, I ended up getting it later on again, but I was right. like, hey, I, they still owe me my jump cert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I felt like that was the first time where I, kind of almost like evolved into another higher level of the coach. Hmm. And well, then the well, next let, let, let's keep pausing there. Hold on. Cause, cause I, I kind of, in my knowledge of you knew that this was a, a stepping up to a different level as well. So hang on for there. Cause there are a couple more questions to lead us into there. I, I'm curious about your own athleticism. You, you know, you jumped as high as seven foot six. When did you, and how did you make the decision that you were done being the athlete and focusing on the coaching side? Well, God did that for me. He tore my <laughs> he, oh, is that right? Yeah, I tore my Achilles. Oh, so you'll love no. this one. I was wearing those. Remember those strength shoes? The, the like the yeah, big the platform shoes. Oh yeah. my gosh. And I'd worn them since I was like 16. And my calf was sore and I was at Northridge and I was like, it was in 2004. And I felt like, man, I have the maturity to finally make this team. Because like in 2000, I didn't have the maturity because making the team was the end all and be all for me. Hmm. And in 2004, I was like, this isn't going to make me better. This mm -hmm. is just, you know, I had the maturity, I had the physical, I was healthy, and I was making a great run. And even my athletes were like, damn, coach, we're out there at, out there at 7 a.m. walking to class, and we see you working out every morning. And it was good for them to see that. But mm -hmm. I was uh, bounding in them, and I tore my Achilles, and it was kind of like, okay, but now. And it, it wasn't the end all the be all. Like I said, uh, you know, talk about serendipitous. Um, I tore my Achilles. My mom took the week off and uh, took care of me. And we spent this quality time, had the conversation. You know, you talked about you interviewed Boo and it was like a thank you to all the coaches. Mm -hmm. and thank you for everything. It, it's the same conversation you want to have with your parents where mm -hmm. you're sitting there. Thank you. Thank you for adopting me. Yeah. Thank you for making my life better. Thank Amen. you for believing in me when I didn't want to go to med school and be a coach and that right. you thought I was going to be the best <laughs> coach out there, you know, because because of whatever. And so we spent that week together and mm. then you know i said it earlier my mom passed away less than a year later oh, so man. i'd tear my achilles fifty thousand hundred times absolutely that week with my mom so it, it, it was it's amazing how life works that's so good certain things happen and so uh that was probably the best week of my life because mm. i got to have that conversation got to spend time with my mom and, oh, man. and and little did i know less than a year later she would pass away and so oh. um so it was, it was, it was awesome. I mean, honestly, I, I, I can't, I can never, you know, talk about how important it was, but for me, I kind of went through everything, you know, as a high jumper, I was seven, four, it came really, really easy to me. And then I struggled in college. You know, I struggled academically. I struggled not academically from that standpoint, just managing my academics, managing my sleep, managing my training. I mean, I started triple jumping, long jumping. I think, you know, what I jumped like, I don't know, wind legal, 24 and a half, 25 wind aided. And I tripped up like 49, some mid or high or something like that. And, and, um, and then, you know, high jumped uh, seven, six. And so um, even though, you know, multi-time all American, it definitely wasn't what I, my expectations were. Cause I almost got seven, five, seven, seven, five and three quarters in high school. And I didn't see that bar again until I was a junior. High, high jump is so frustrating. Yeah, and, and, and it was one of those so things. unique. I, I use this all the time. It's like, and I think that's kind of why I got into coaching is that I went from this unbelievable athlete who's super successful and believed in myself to having a lot of doubt and then believing in myself again. And <laughs> so it was, it, and, and I use this a lot for, I had a lot of success with kids who just graduated college coming to me as post collegians later on in my career. And people ask that. And I'm like, because if you're college in high school, I was a, I was red and in college they wanted me to be blue. So they took me from red to blue right away. Hmm. And what they should have done is they should have taken me on the spectrum and made me a little, you know, mm. kind of a red, you know, mm -hmm. reddish purplish red mm -hmm. with a little bit more purple, then purple blue. And then eventually I get to the blue, but taking mm. me from red all the way to blue right away was, was a disaster. And so hmm. I tell college coaches and I tell, you know, post collegiate coaches, don't forget that that spectrum. And so if you can take the spectrum of taking the kid from whatever, I mean, I was a kid who didn't do much in high school. So mm -hmm. the warm up for me was 
the hardest thing I'd ever done. <laughs> just the warm up. All right. So, you know, throwing in weights and in class and all this other stuff was just too much for right. my nervous system and all that. Not my work ethic. All right. I worked my butt off and it didn't, and it didn't, you know, frustrate me, but my body just couldn't handle that huh. transition. So I struggled. And so it took me a couple of years to, you know, go from that. And I think that, uh, uh, but that helped me understand it, understand the sport. And then it made me a better coach because I understood that. So <laughs> taking high school kids from different kind of training ages, because you learn, we learn about training age, but we don't really understand what that means until you're in it. And, and we talk about individualized training, but then we throw everybody together from day one on the same warm up. Like you pointed out, we don't think about what their background was in athleticism. And, and you're right. You throw in the other sides of the academic and the academic stress, the being away from home, uh, being on your own. Yeah. It's, that's, yeah, that's interesting. So we're up to, um, right up, right as we go leave from Oklahoma to go back home. Uh, but before we take that next step, you know, People like you are what we need for the sport in regards to the things that we don't necessarily always pay attention to uh, for right or wrong. And it's for me, it's probably always right. Uh, we highlight the coaches and, of course, the athletes. But we you know, we talk about the great coaches at this university and this uh, these private coaches. You mentioned Bobby Kersey and things like that. Uh, and that's all good. But there's this underlying area of track and field there's several underlying areas of track and field that have to get done you know people have to process the teams for team usa we don't necessarily always talk about the the workload and paperwork and all that kind of stuff well there's also the people and you've, you've alluded to it here a little bit in regards to the coaching education which of course is huge for you it was, it was instrumental i've talked about it many many times here on the podcast uh, I, I would be who i am today even not as a coach if it weren't for coaching education uh, my give back was i taught you know co close to about 30 level ones that was kind of my way of, of giving back where are you as as we're up to that oklahoma time where are you in the spectrum of coaching education you, you've already talked about you know you've done the level twos and usa w's and cscs's things like that where are you in regards to uh, curriculum writing or teaching? Are you doing any of that at this point? Yeah. So, so when I got to Oklahoma, um, gosh, so there was a shift in the coaching. Um, I don't want to say when I was at Oklahoma, so it's got to be between 2005 and 2010. So sometime in between, and mm -hmm. I want to say it was five or six or something like that. Is this so, the USATF, USTF, yeah, CCCA? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, 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 and I, I was at Gill, so 06, 07. Spin. Yeah, and I have a positive spin for it. I actually think, you know, a lot of people go, well, there was this. Yes, I mean, they were underpaid by USA Track and Field and things like that. But I think something drastically positive happened. Almost, it was kind of like Freakonomics. Where, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, You yeah. know, that because that, uh, I start to see it now. And, and, and I'll get into that why. But... So what happened was then in 2006 or five or six, they invited me to now kind of because Boo had done so much and they were leaning on him so much that they're like, okay, we need the next line of instructors. So mm -hmm. um, they invited me to Chicago and it might be six or seven or something like that. And I kind of was like an underling and I was going to teach mm -hmm. them all aspects of it. So it was, it was Jim Van Ottigan, Kaba, um, Boo and Todd Lane. And mm -hmm. so we were all kind of teaching it together. So that's a lot of names and coaches for just a level two. Yeah. And so it was so cool to do it from the other aspect of like, you know, be behind the scenes kind of with it instead of being instructed. But I mean, that's a pretty good staff of, you know, level two, you know, with, I mean, not to, but just to be there with Jim, Kaba, Boo and, and Todd and myself. Absolutely. So that, that was the first year. And, and so, you know, that happens, I get my feet wet and, you know, and, and I, gosh, I studied so much for that thing. I think I could have probably, you know, literally recited it without even looking at it because <laughs> I was so nervous that I wanted to do, put my best foot forward, you right. know, kind of, you know, honor boo and, mm -hmm. and Danny to teach all the three. And it was just amazing. And I got to sit there and, you know, just really have a, an amazing conversation with Dan, which was the first time I ever got to do that. Hmm. And so, um, uh, we, we teach it. And then the very next year, the explosion happens. Oh, so, so Mike Korn and boo and them started, we're going to start this thing for USTFCCA working with Sam and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, so then it became a de facto USA track and field versus USTFCCA. And, um, you know, and, and 
I, Terry Crawford was then part of it. And Terry has been a huge mentor to me. I mean, Terry was, she got me the job at the center and, you know, I mean, she's become like a mom to me. Yeah. She's awesome. Yeah. And we talk all the time and, and, um, you know, and her old Tennessee draw, you know, um, and stuff like that, but she's super intelligent lady and, and, and been amazing mentor to me. And so, um, you know, they asked me the two ways, you know, you're going to go to USTF CCA and, and I, and I, I validate what they say, Hey, we're doing all this. This is our, uh, um, you know, our property and our you know intellectual property and we're getting paid nothing for it basically. And we're spending all this time where USTF CCA is going to make a model where you're going to get paid for your time. You're going to get two to three times what USA track and field is. And you're going to get, you know, paid for what you try to do. And, you know, Terry came to me and said, Hey, really need you, you know, you, you need to stay with USA track and field and, and this kind of stuff. And so, you know, on part, you know, I, I didn't want to, it was, I was torn. Do I go with Boo, who's kind of been a mentor, or do I stay with, but I've always been that person who doesn't go with the norm, you know, like, no offense, I, I love Florida, I love LSU, but, or in Arkansas, but I never wanted to go to those schools because they already have a jumps legacy. Mm. I want to build my, so I wanted to do my own path. And so it was kind of that way with USA track and field. I felt like, even though the new path was USTFCC, I felt some honor honorable by staying with USA track and field. So yeah. I, I chose to stay with that. That, that couldn't and, be easy for you. Uh, I mean, you no, know, it I, mean, I, I know how I feel about Boo and I know you're in the very same vein. Yeah, there, so that no, couldn't have been I easy. Talk, I talked to him about it and he said, no, Jeremy, like you got to do. We yeah, he's going to be supportive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he totally. And, and, and I heard why he did what he did and, mm-hmm. and kind of, you know, we'll mic more and stuff like that. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and they had validated, they totally validated. And, and I was still young in the process. So I didn't have as much of that, uh, you know, kind of goggles and things like that. In the history, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and in the end, probably, I think, USTFCCA, as far as coaching and kind of that, I, I like it's more honorable because you're working with college coaches and you're working with track and field mm-hmm. where, I mean, you know, you probably saw it too, doing level ones. You started to see almost this kind of like other coach come in, which was okay, you know, but for the track purist, it was like, this guy wanted to be a speed agility guy yep. and he wanted to be a certified, you know, sprint coach. So he yep. got his level one, you yep. know, and it's like, so that looks good on paper, but it's not really what it was. And so it's not advanced I, in our sport. That, yeah. that, was, that was for a private business of baseball and football and basketball, things like that, which yeah. are fine. There's, there's a place yeah. for that, but. And, and I've, and I've done those and yeah. I do them. So I, I can't knock it, but, but the right. point being is it was like, it, from a pure standpoint, the USTFCCA product was kind of more of a pure thing right. where the USATF thing was kind of a money maker. And, and it right. is, I mean, you know, anybody who teaches one knows that like, you know, you make less than 50% and they, mm-hmm. and you see track and field, all they do is send you like a book or something. <laughs> yep. you know? and, and, and you do all the legwork. And so, um, you know, and it is what it is. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's educated tens of thousands of coaches and mm-hmm. it was a start, but from that, I stayed with USA track and field. And uh, I, from that point, it was crazy. The next year we we're in, um, oh, what's the school in Philly, uh, just outside of Philly, really Villanova. Oh, Villanova. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so because of everything, uh, we have two instructors. Only. So you go from like this army of five to six. Five, like, and not just five, five amazing. Yeah, I, I was going to say Mount Rushmore is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To two. You know, and, and, and oh. no offense. I mean, I, I love the guy. He's a great guy. But I have, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Michigan State and at Clemson. Why am I oh, my boy, Chris Bostwick. Yeah, Chris Bostwick. Yes. Chris yeah, yeah. and I are teaching level two together. Yes, 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 yes. Chris got stuck and got flights got canceled and couldn't show up so i had to teach the first two days of level two by myself oh wow second year of me doing it and i just felt terrible oh wow you know and, and i felt good about it but i felt terrible because it wasn't like five years later where literally you know i had such command of the material right and, you know this whatever and so you know that's you, tough listening to me all day every day for two days yeah and it's all day that's that's part of it this is like a three hour block this is 12 hours yeah yeah yeah. chris is able to show up for the last day and oh you know stuff like that and so it was like almost like feet to the fire 
And, you know, they're getting questions about, you know, hey, USTFCA, what's going on with this? Should I go to that instead of this? And there's this whole kind of us versus them. And the whole entire time I'm like, no, like the more I'm an education person. So the more education you get better. If you get it from Altus, if you're getting it from USTFCCA Mm -hmm. and USTF. And I argue now that the high school kids and college kids are doing so well because of the fact USTFCCA and USATF started educating more coaches and making them knowledgeable and so there's i mean i'm looking at these kids and they're just like you know 12 year old runs 48 seconds uh, <laughs> you know uh 16 year old girl runs 12 not you know you just right. looking across the board and i'm like and i think that's a one of those freakonomics of that split ended up paying huge yeah for the grassroots track and field so, so i've got to ask you a question you, you, you'll be able to either validate my theory here or punch holes and I'll never say this theory again. <laughs> so, cause, cause you, you know, you're into the coaching education uh, on a different level than just taking in, in certifications, which I'm not poo poo on that, that you have to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you've written curriculum, you've studied and helped build curriculum. And you've seen, like you just pointed out there, uh, what maybe the USATF, USTF, CCCA split did for coaching education. And now we have Altus on top of that. And what COVID kind of taught us was like, oh man, there's like these really knowledgeable people like Kaba and uh, Chris yeah. Parno that can actually get on there and do Zoom calls to help, yeah. again, bring this massive amounts. Uh, it would kind of bring everybody up to the same table on the on the level of, um, uh, of coaching education. So here's my theory. To your point, where you, I mean, like exactly what you said there, like athleticism right now in track and field is off the charts, right? I mean, they're, we're, we're, they're doing things, you know, what Mondo's doing in the pole vault. Oh my goodness. What, of course, what Sydney did in the hurdles and uh, a thing uh, Mo is doing. I mean, it's just, it's crazy right now, right? I mean, the, the, the men's 400, everything, there's not an event right now that is just like, it's, it's just unbelievable, right? And so what I believe is, so you, you, and Jeremy, we know each other well enough. So you come back and tell me that I'm an idiot for this. It's okay. A quite okay. So when you first get into coaching, because all you know is how you were coached, we typically fall back to that coaching style until we learn more and gain our own knowledge and experiences, right? I think that in the next, say, 10, 15, 20 years, what we see today in track and field is going to be child's play because- Kids that are being coached today, everywhere from that 12-year-old example you gave to uh, Sydney right now, they're being coached at a higher level because of coaching education. And so when they in- inevitably become the coaches next, they're they're going to fall back to how they were coached because that's all they're going to know. And well, that bar is going to be at such a higher level than what guys like you and I, how we were coached. You know, when coaches first came to us, th- they, d- they didn't have that much. And so we co- we coached like them. So I just think we're like as, as good as it is right now. I think because of coaching education, it's going to it, because it layers, it's going to be unbelievable here in the next two, three uh, Olympic cycles. I, I completely agree with that statement. And, and I, I also and feel I knew like, I was smart. <laughs> and I also feel like it's the, uh, you know, I think it's because these coaches now have the technical. So, so I would long say, so now that I've worked at the training center for a while and been able to be around coaches in the U S we were pretty lucky. We just throw spaghetti on the wall, which sticks is like our next great athlete. Right. And I mean, the amount of 10, 10 hundred meter runners that don't make it um, is crazy. Right. But in another country that doesn't happen. Right. Like if they have a kid who runs 10, three, they have a whole sports science staff and everything to milk everything out of that kid. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, you know, I, I'll take the long jump. Michelle Tornius has become a really good friend and Michelle is a long jumper, finished fourth at Olympics in 2012, multi-time European champion competes for Sweden. And Michelle didn't jump eight meters till he was 26 years old. If in the U S you're, you're 26 and you have jumped eight meters, you're out of the sport. Wow. Right? Yeah. And so, but because he's from Sweden, he was supported. And then he really had huh. his, you know, success from 28 to 32, which is where most ath- great athletes, you know, you, right. you go Will and Chris, Chris out, but you start to look at people like Jeff Henderson and, mm-hmm. you know, he developed later and, 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 you know, those athletes and in the U S unfortunately, it's like, if you're not a, you're not a developer between the ages of 22, huh. uh, 23, 21, you're out most likely out of the school. Right. And so um, I think that all this coaching allows for the technical models to get better. And quite frankly, like we talked about it in college, you only have so many hours, you have only have so much. Uh, they're 18 to 22 years old. So what's the best thing to do? Get them stronger and faster. Mm-hmm. Right. And so 
it's okay from their technical model because we're just going to get them faster and we do a mm-hmm. fantastic job but faster and stronger only get you so far so then we got these kids who run 10 10 but we can't change their technical model one mm-hmm. because they need to make their money and two you know we whether you know it is what it is. We can't take the time for individuality to mm-hmm. change the technical model to get them to run nine, nine or whatever it is. And so, and that's a lot of places across the board. And so with that, then you have, and, and, and again, it just gets into so many different layers. I mean, you got these groups like, you know, Travis Gap at Arkansas mm-hmm. and, and you have, uh, you know, Nick Peterson at Florida and I'm just calling the jumps and Todd Lane and, and, you know, and, you know james and all the guys you know you know who they are um uh, mm-hmm. james course, Young, yep. texas mm-hmm. tech uh <laughs> he's gonna be mad at me for i'm not calling him out <laughs> um, you know he's a friend of mine and he's oh, i've mentioned him on the podcast before so we're keith. just gonna let him go okay yeah. okay okay no nah, okay, keith, right. keith, 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 keith man keith yeah, yeah no nah, keith, keith's my guy. there's there's so many great coaches right mm-hmm. and, and but it's crazy because they have their college team and then they have you know these post-collegiate kids that stick around and it's like um, you know, and, and when I was in the college setting, I was like, yeah, the kids should stick around and stuff like that. But then post-collegiately, what happens, right? From at the training center from May, you know, basically the third week in May until the first week in June, I have six or seven of the top jumpers in the country out training with me because their college coaches can't be with them because mm-hmm. they're at regionals or kind like of conference whatever. regional. National. Yeah. yeah. And, and I coach those kids in Europe and in the islands all the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to help because, you know, they're part, that's part of what it is. And so, but th- there's no support either. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got Dwight who's got a, you know, post collegiate group and um, that's it. It's not affiliated with the college, you know? And so, um, I, you know, there's not a lot, even in the field events, there's, you know, maybe, well, Ryan Whiting was, but now he's part of ASU. So, right, yeah. um, and I think you got throw deep, out uh, with, uh, mm-hmm. in, in Georgia, but there's yeah, Mike very, judge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's not very many post-collegiate coaches in the field events that, that, you know, have that. And so there's, you know, and, and even for the sprint coaches, you know, it's hard. I mean, you know, Flo, he's got this unbelievable, you know, team winning national championships. And then he's, you know, luckily he has the dedication and whatever to have his post collegiate group mm-hmm. and say with Coach Holloway and, and, you know, on and on and on. Um, but it gets to a point, you know, too, where we can't just give every kid to those coaches. You know, right. cause that's not fair to them. And, you know, it's not fair to the kids either. And so, um, we're just at a dilemma right now, even in the U.S. So. Well, well, let's let's catch up to that part for you. So where we left off on your journey was uh, Oklahoma. You're done. You go back home uh, to be with dad. Uh, but you're a, a guy with no home. And what I mean by that, no job home. What, yeah, so what do you exactly. do? And it's funny that you mentioned about going back to California. You said, I'm a Southern Cal guy. Uh, I can't remember who was the guest here just recently. I said, I kind of I was, I was, he was a distance person who coaches, uh, sprints and jumps and hurdles. And I was like, you know, my take on Californians, every Californian I've ever met, uh, they all want to get back to California. I go, so I, the, what I was leading up for him was you're, you're a distance runner. Are you, are you wanting to get back to coaching distance? Like, you, you know, distance guys are their, their own little thing. So I love that. You're like, I'm a Southern Cal guy, man. So the, that traction, that, that tractor beam from California, man is strong. You go back, you go back home. It's hard to blame you because it's gorgeous out there. Yeah. What do you do though? You, you don't, you don't have a job. I can't believe yeah, you did that. No, no I, I don't have a job, but it's one of those things that, you know, the one faith I've always had is myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like I'll find a way. And so I was able to kind of leverage some stuff where I had six NFL and six baseball guys, but you think about it. And then I ended up growing where I had 40 kids that I was training. Wow. Yeah. And actually it was ended up being very lucrative. It ended up being way more than what I made in college. It was mm-hmm. like twice what I was making in college. And it was good too, because I was still paying my mortgage in Oklahoma and paying rent in California. And oh yeah, that'll take I, all the pay right there. <laughs> yeah, I was driving like 200 miles a day, you know, cause then I was also, um, you know, first I was just working with kids in Orange County and uh, you know, it worked out really, really well from that standpoint. But then it was two years where I think I worked 360 out of 365 days. It was, cause I couldn't say no. You know, so I'm, whether it was like coaching level one, level twos, 
I think I did like 10 level ones that year. I think I did like level twos. I was going internationally to do. I top. remember this. You were doing, it felt like you were doing every level one. Yeah, I, I remember I this. I was doing so much and it was just my kind of way of just like, okay, I've got to stabilize myself and make money. And after two years, like, wait, what did I do? What did I make? You mm -hmm. know, because it was just like, you're, you're not doing that. You're just, you know, kind of whatever. And I was at, during that time too, when I was out, I was actually offered in, the job at ASICS. So um, Ben oh. Sazer left. Oh yeah, Ben. Ben's I making, remember him. Yeah, yeah I loved him. Job, his job at ASICS. And it was crazy. I went on an interview in like gosh, late August, early September and went in for a second one in maybe late September and then didn't hear anything. So I was like, okay, I didn't get the job at you know ASICS and stuff. So I was training my NFL guys and doing all this kind of stuff. And, and I was already doing that. So I was kind of like, I, you know, I need time to be able to do that. And I get a call from HR in December. I'm like, Hey, we're going to start next week. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And so I ended up meeting with the HR lady and just going through, Hey, like, just so you know, I interviewed in September. And right. I heard anything. Yeah, you're and the first I've heard since then. <laughs> yeah. And now you're calling me to like offer me a job. And, and, and I'm like, I've moved on so far that, wow. you know, it's not, and, and it ended up being a blessing because, you know, being like the manager for like, you know, shoe company and doing that kind of stuff probably wasn't it was a way to stay in the sport, but it right. probably wasn't the right thing for me. It, it, um, do you know, is Ben still at Nike? No, Ben's back with ASICS. Is he? Okay, I haven't yeah, talked to him in so long. I, yeah, yeah. I, I met him when he was at ASICS, uh, I think through Drake Relays. And yeah. really, you know, for a guy in the different yeah. part of our industry, really, yeah. really well, hey, Ben him. was a coach. So Ben was at UC Irvine when I was at Northridge. So oh, we were in the same conference cool. and everything. Yeah. And so, uh, and Ben was a pretty fast sprinter. I always joke, Ben's got the biggest caps I've ever seen. Um <laughs> But so, yeah, so now he's back with. Oh, good for him. Good for him. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's pretty high up with them. And so, yeah. so I, you know, it's funny, you kind of go full circle and, and ASICS wasn't the right thing for me. So I still continued to, to do that. And then shortly after that, in, in January, Terry said, we have a position at the center for you if mm -hmm. you would like it. And so it was like more of a director of ops slash coach slash this. And it's only going to pay this much. And I was like, well, let me get my feet back into coaching. It was a great experience. So I got to work with Ty Seven. Art oh. Benegas was hired as the, uh, like a consultant. Um, yeah, that's right. Craig Poole was the director. And Al Joyner obviously was out there. Mm -hmm. And Joaquin Cruz was working with Para. And so it was just, it was cool. Like I was just like, I was more enamored by the fact that like, hey, I'm working with you know, two gold medalists, you know, and stuff like that. But this well, was this when USATF or USOC, because the, the yeah. Olympic Training Center out there really kind of uh, fell on hard times. Like no one really was managing. No one was really doing any kind of uh, elite um, support, like bringing the athletes in. That, that, that would have been actually before. So around uh, 2001, 02, 03, I was the junior uh, high hurdle uh, uh, elite coach. So, you know, I brought out all, you know, the best high schoolers, 19 years old or whatnot out there. But there really wasn't like like that was not the place where elites went to go to train, even though they had great facilities and things like that. Was this when they started trying to reawaken that? And actually, you guys did a great job. Yes. I remember for a while there were some some really good guys and gals training there. Yeah. So the USOPC ran it up until like 10 or 10 or 11. And then they, they said, here, we're going to give you the money. We're going to give you this amount of money, but you have to have the residence program. So the right. mm -hmm. first hire that they had was, or the first person they were trying to hire was uh, uh, Ter Terry took it over and mm -hmm. she was like, well, we're going to try to hire Cliff Revelto and, you know, his wife. And oh, Cliff, yeah. you know, they come out and they're like, this is awesome, but like, this, like, even it, it's so expensive and, and I live in whatever. And then, you know, he leveraged that and he got, ended up getting this huge contract at Kansas State, much deserved and stuff. And so, yeah. um, so then they hired Coach Poole, Dr. Poole, and, and he kind of took over and it was kind of a different program. So there were some kids there and then it was a transition time and it was, uh, we started this uh, like funnel system where we were trying to develop kids into athletes. So um, it definitely was probably the highest level of athletes we started having mm -hmm. once I got in there. So like Joe Kovacs came straight out of college. I'll say I remember some throwing was going on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joe mm -hmm. Kovacs and, and, and obviously Ryan after it during 16, actually. Um, um, and it brought out a big homie, uh, Darrell Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we had, uh, uh, gosh, from the standpoint, it, it just, you know, higher level athlete, like uh, in the, in the jumps, it was Mike Hartfield and mm -hmm. Will and, 
Brittany and, and, and uh, that's right. Brittany and spent some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So we went from, I think they had two Olympic medals and we actually had to give one, you know, Toby Stevenson had one and then we, one was in the 400 hurdles because uh, Sheena, Sheena Tosta was training at the center mm. like a couple of days a week. So to that point, I think those were the two medals that we had, you know, and then in 12, you know, 11, Will comes out in that pro and he wins the medal and then it just starts, starts snowballing. So Brittany comes out obviously in 12 and, and, uh, Brad, I think Walker won an indoor medal as Will won two, one, one. He won the triple jump and then outdoors, Will won two medals. I mean, it just snowballed. So we ended up averaging, you know, three medals at every Olympics. What, what was the d difference for you? You know, when we get into coaching, regardless of the level, it's high school or club or college, we all have, and, and that's a blanket statement here, and I don't like those necessarily, but we all want to coach Olympians. Like, I mean, that's the Holy grail in our sport, right? The gold medal, et cetera, and making the Olympic team, you know, the rings. What is the difference? You, you've coached a lot of different levels, a lot of different uh, levels of athletes. You're immersed with, I mean, you just named some of the best jumpers that we've ever had in America, Brittany Reese, Will Clay, you can stop right there. And, and I've insulted 10 other amazing yeah. <laughs> jumpers, right? Uh, what, what is the difference as you, because you were immersed into it. You, you weren't, coaching on the college level you weren't doing club you were it was all about how do we get to the world champs or the olympic teams and how do we medal what, what's the difference as a coach whether it's time management psychology um i i, I hesitate i don't think it's training but you you tell me but what's the kind of macro bigger difference working with that type of athlete on the 24 7 basis i i don't think it's the meat and potatoes but mm -hmm. it's the fluff around it oh interesting so so meaning that like meaning that like in college, it's about stronger, faster, you know, in, in that, and we can do some technical, but you're limited by eight and 20 hours. Right. And and there's things that I know every college coach wish they could do, but they probably don't have the time for it, you know, or, or bandwidth to do it at our level. Like I can train six hours a day. We don't train six hours a day, but you know, the kids come in at 10, we do, you know, prehabilitation therapy, they get, you know, treatment, whatever, then I do a lot of things that I just couldn't do at the college level because we didn't have the time to do. Hmm. And so then it's, you know, like our training starts at 11, we're done by like one thirty. you know, for the technical standpoint, we go eat lunch. Then they come down and we do, you know, what I call it, you know, pre weight room, you know, kind of things where we're opening up our hips, stability, all this different kind of stuff. We do it for 45 minutes and then we go to the weight room you know, for 45 minutes or whatever. You, you just mentioned pre weight room, 45 minutes. Some people don't go to the weight room for 45 minutes. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and we, I try to limit the actual weight room stuff to about 45 minutes because I know, you know, for a thrower, it's different. Like they need to live in the weight room. They need to be in there, but for a, uh, you know, a, a jumper, you know, and sprinter, they have basically, the attention span for about 45 minutes so we you know we try to lift three to four days a week and shorter kind of stints but mm. um, and then we you know it's like i'm pre-programming ourselves before we go to the weight room so that we're ready to transition into that and so we do a lot of just different kind of stuff um you know whether it's slant board or bands or mm. um you know isometric holes things like that before we go to the weight room to do whatever we do are doing during that block. And so that's the stuff that I can do because they don't have to go to class. Most of them don't have jobs mm. or if they have jobs. I tell them it's got to be before 10 a.m. and after 4 p.m. And so, mm. you know, they're professional athletes. And so that's the stuff that we can really do. And then I can individualize, which, you know, mm. all of it's harder to do. So I can sit there and say, hey, Brittany, we're struggling with this con concept. I don't want to be, you know, it's just you and I. Let's, let's go out there, you know, come at one o'clock or two o'clock and right. do work. And so those are the things that I'm able to do that I couldn't do in college just because, you know, you got to work around class schedules and all the other and hours and everything else like that. So, so that's the difference. And then the so bigger. Sound, sounds like for what you're describing so far is you were able to get deeper into the training modalities exactly. and really do individualization. Yeah. And then, mm. and then the biggest thing that was amazing to me was that I think this the center, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about this where 
it was first uh, Northridge and all my certifications took me like left my first level to open my eyes to things. And then it was like at Northridge, I got all my certifications and learned and went to that next level. And then at Oklahoma, I started teaching and writing and doing all that kind of stuff. So it took me to the next level. Then I feel like the next level was actually working with sports that weren't track and field. So I became a movement specialist because I was working mm. with NFL guys, major league baseball guys, high school kids that were in all different sports, volleyball, and there's movement patterns and stuff that I was like, okay, yeah, we're missing this, right? So, you know, we're a very linear kind of thing, but you still have to have curvilinear and, you know, rotational things to keep ourselves healthy. Mm -hmm. How much are we doing this in college? So yeah. know, in college, are we still doing some of the side to side things that are still going to be huge and beneficial to us? Are we doing right. an external rotation or internal rotation? Because we externally rotate almost in everything we're doing, right? So being able to like look at those things and make sure those modalities are part of my training. And so, but the bigger thing was the fact of who I got to rub shoulders with. And so that was what was big. I mean, you know, people were going out to Altus, you know, a lot of college coaches to see Dan and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that and, and Andreas and, and them. And, and so they got to do that. I get to do that almost like on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, so Bobby Kersey would come out with Allison for two to three weeks every year. So I'd get to sit there and I'd be done with practice and just watch practice and talk to Bobby. Oh, wow. People, pay, people would pay for that ticket. Exactly. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and he doesn't really do talk. So I'm sitting there. Right. Like I hear, I remember one practice that stands out for me and he was just, you know, talking to the girls about how important it was to run on the inside of the lane you know, why to do it, what it looked like, how it staged out, how he set it up and he's wow. educating and I'm sitting there going, I get to see this. No one, you know, cause he's at the center. Right. You know, Johnson, when he was working with Eric, you know, LaShawn Merritt and the stuff he was doing and just kind of whatever. And then just talking to Brooks and then Andreas, uh, uh, Thorkelson, when he was, you know, when all the jazz stuff and the training, yeah. kind of different training he was doing. And then you know, the hammer thrower, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was multi-time the Hungarian, but he'd come out and just, you know, uh, Carolina Kloof and, mm. and, and Yannick Tagaro with him. And I mean, it was just like worldwide, not just coaches and athletes and being able to talk to them and see them and stuff like talk to Art about strength training, you know, uh, talk to Mac Wilkins about, you know, kind of his experience uh, just on and on and on. So that was the, you know, amazing you know, Nelly Omoro coming out with his group or just on and on and on. Mm. Wolfgang Ritzdorf coming out, you know, um, Franz Bosch, you know, things like uh. that. And so during my time, it was just eye-opening from the standpoint of just being able to talk to and see and implement some of the stuff they were doing or theories or process like that. So where is this? You're, you're going to love this one. This just popped into my head here. Where is your ego at this time. And, and here's what I mean by this. You know, you just painted a picture, like everybody listening right now is like, you, you know, sitting there watching Bobby do his craft. And you're right. He doesn't speak. He doesn't, uh, he, he's not the guy who's on doing his own YouTubes and teaching level twos and whatnot. He, he's, he's, he has this thing and he does this thing and does it at a pretty high level, uh, guys and gals. Uh, but you know, so you paint this picture of, you, you know, you're, you're able to like, you're at the front row of watching him and Brooks Johnson and Franz and, and Dan. And I, I mean, the list goes along. It, it could be easy for you as you, cause you're also coaching at a high level. Let's not take away what you are. You are actually doing coaching wise as well. You're coaching at a very high level. It would be easy and maybe forgivable uh, to have an ego of like, man, um, so-and-so is getting a lot of pub and is making this much money at this school, or this person is, you know, uh, making the head coach of the Olympic team, whatever, but, and I'm not naming any, you know, this is not yeah. directed to anybody. It could be easy for you to get into your own ego and be like, why am I not making X? Why am I not thought of as this big, uh, guru, et cetera, uh, massively? Cause to me, you are, you are that guru, <laughs> but how are you ego wise? in your coaching and coaching progression and profession at that point? You know, it, it, you do like, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I've coached 18 Olympic and world championship medalists. Right. And, and that's, you know, something I'm, you know, honored to do, but I think because I have a relationship with the kids and I don't see them as widgets or medals or anything like that, 
I've never been that way. Mm. And so for me, it's like, I do very well financially. I get paid, you know, I mean, yeah, I could probably get paid more from my jobs, but I've been able to leverage, like, you know, I work with Korea or I work with this mm. country and they pay me really well to, you know, work with the athletes, but, but I love what I do. I mean, I have an assistant who I pay, I have, you know, three people, four people on my payroll under, mm. you know, my MBA training and stuff like that. And so, um, I'm blessed to kind of do that and kind of be my own boss now, you know, mm-hmm. which, which is critical. And, 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 you know, I've been to 76 countries and 49 States. And so, you know, I, wait, 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 wait. what's the one state? Uh, Alaska. I was like, it better be Alaska. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you, you, so, you gotta be like, no, I went to Alaska. I just haven't gone to, uh, Georgia. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so for my 50th, I'm going to do, uh, you know, Alaska. So yes. Oh, gonna, that's you know, so cool. So, yeah. That'll be a highlight for me. And so, uh, but it, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it can be, but you can't, you know, get mad at that. You know, it, it's hard, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not going to be disparaging to anything, but like, if I was a distance coach with 18 world and Olympic medals, they would throw the kitchen sink at me. Or if I was a sprint coach and they would throw the kitchen sink at me and us field event coaches know that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not going to be, you know, despite our success and all that kind of stuff, you're not going to do that. I mean, I think they said there's 18 distance enclaves in America, right? Yeah, and yeah, a lot. Yeah. Some kind of yeah. shoe company. Mm-hmm. Well, there's two post collegiate jump programs, and and you know, and I, uh, you know, and I've been pretty successful, and I'm not, you know, sponsored by anybody. You right. know, I, I just I'm able to leverage a lot of what I do to, you know, financially be pretty solid and do well, but. Um, that's neither here nor there. And so I, I can't get, you know, upset by it. It's just interesting to go to another country like Scotland or Sweden or whatever. And they just put me on, like, they treat me like, you know, like I do interviews and I'm, I'm, you know, this and in 12 years at the center, I've never been interviewed once by, you know, like track field news or whoever. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't care. It, it is what it is because the most important thing is that, I literally get hundreds, if not thousands of requests for video watch or coach oh, sure. or anything like that. So I know that within the jumps community that uh, a lot of people respect and, and they say positive things and, and they, you know, and, and they just, they say how great a job I'm doing and stuff like that. And that's not what I do it for. I do it for the athletes, but it's nice to also see that, you know, I'm helping other people. Mm. And at the end of the day, I think that's, you know, yeah, you sell stuff, but Mike, you're, you're a helper and you mm-hmm. want to see the sport move ahead. So, right. you know, when your equipment, you know, can help in that sense, you're going to be very happy with it. And right. I'm kind of the same way. It's yeah. like my coaching videos and my thing can help, you know, then that's the way it is. It's like, you know, like I have 16,000 followers on Instagram. Right. And, and I didn't try to buy them. It's right. just me posting stuff and, right. and people going like, Hey, that helps and that stuff. So, I'm always trying to post things that can help coaches or yeah, it's, it's value know. giving, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And that's my little way of giving back. So, so keep us transitioning because the U S the, the Olympic training center there in Chula Vista goes through some transformations, right? Cause it eventually becomes yeah. the Chula Vista training yeah. center. And and yeah. now, and I, I'm not even really caught up with what it is now, what is going on. Keep it. T- tell us how that training center evolved. So, so or, I, I, or, or devolved by the way, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's kind of, it's just an interesting kind of thing. I, I, I don't ever feel like anybody's promised a job, especially in track and field. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's changed. I mean, you, you know, you had coaches that coach forever and now coaches are getting fired, which mm. is, if you think about it, it's like coach track and field. We're not doing like, you know, we're not football or basketball, which is making right. millions. We're, we're yeah. literally costing millions, you know, and, and I think it was interesting. <laughs> I think Sam said it. I talked to him recently and uh, in the last six months and he said you know basically track and field's almost a billion dollar business as far as buying tracks and hell yeah running, sure, sure. running you know mm-hmm. tourism and everything else and i believe it. i mean think mm-hmm. of d1 d2 d3 junior college all that mm-hmm. you know kind of thing it's easily a billion dollars you know and so um, i think it was like 900 something you know 980 or 70 something mm-hmm. million dollars and so um but in that in track and field and in kind of what happens is that the usopc owned the training center um and in 2016 they gave up the training center they didn't want to run 
it, it, it cost five million dollars to do business at, mm. at that thing and it was empty mostly like mm-hmm. it was probably at 30 40 percent capacity right but that wasn't their job to make money their job was high performance and so you know we had three medals in in, in london had five medals in rio wow in track we were the seventh best country in the world where wow. the training center was because you had ryan krauser joe kovacs yeah. Richard, will clay and jeff henderson you know so you had you know, two gold medals and three silvers, which that's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> and, you know, and so from 16 to 20, unfortunately, they went to the CBE ATC, mm-hmm. the lead athletic training center. So basically the, the Point Loma Nazarene Trust, which is a local school and the city of Chula Vista took over running the center. Mm. So they made it for profit. And so, you know, it's a little bit of everything. USOPC was still giving like three and a half million dollars to CB to the CBATC and then um, USA Track and Field. We were running presence program and we were mm-hmm. offering about six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars budget every year mm-hmm. you know, with coaches' salaries and travel and stuff. Um, in the the years up leading up till uh, twenty, it, it just decreased. I mean, it, it went from you know like we decreased the number of beds, we decreased the number of kind of thing, and then basically after twenty-two, they decided that they weren't going to run the program. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, obviously I have my opinion about it, um, you know, and stuff like that and because of the success we had. I understand if it was a zero sum kind of thing where we right. weren't producing, but, you know, we still had one medal in Tokyo despite all the craziness. And Will wow. Will messed, Will messed the medal by two centimeters. And, <sighs> you know, so it, it, it literally like we were that close to two. And, and at the end of the day, Ryan Krauser and Joe Kovacs will give us so much credit, mm-hmm. because, you know them being and establish themselves at the center so even though they weren't here that's still too yeah it was built off of what they did there it, for sure yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the trials was amazing i mean the trials you know we had you know well, all these great athletes qualify for the team and you know chris mack did a phenomenal job with yeah that. chris one three and great you know, coach who's, who's finally reached her you know potential amazing potential and 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 so you know, up and down, we, we had, a, you know, amazing kind of thing. And then this year, uh, gosh, we had, I think we had like six or seven or eight athletes still, despite no beds, not, no support, wow. local athletes and stuff. We still had seven athletes make the team. And it was the first time, you know, in a long time that we had no medals um, mm. the center. Um, and stuff the, like the, so what is that place now? Like, you know, I used to, I remember going up and you check in, is that so just still, land yeah. now or is anybody well, like you still have, you still have para track and fields here. Yeah. Uh, rugby sevens. We've okay. got, you know, a, a local professional soccer team from, I think the UHL or U, whatever the soccer league is. Um, you've got, uh, uh, archery, you've got mm-hmm. uh, yeah. crew comes out every, like, yeah. so they'll be out shortly and they'll be out for like five months. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then you, we still have about seven or eight athletes that will still train okay. here. Uh, Will Clay, you know, he had a baby, so he's, mm-hmm. in, you know, he'll be here for a while. But, you know, we, uh, my expectation is he'll probably you know, go somewhere else, which is yeah. completely fine. And then uh, we have international athletes that come through. I mean, last year getting ready for Worlds, we had Ukraine, India, oh, yeah. China, uh, Portugal, um, and then like, uh, yeah. so here talking about kind of cool, I get to watch a little bit of practice. Vitaly Petra was out here with his group because he's got the Philippines kid, the Brazilian kid, and then he's got a couple Chinese guys. And so right. he was out here and huh. just the coaches that were out and being able to watch was 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 really cool. Do you so, do you still at this point, you know, you've coached for a long time. Uh, do you still like when you talk about Petrov and some of those guys coming over there, do you still soak it all in? Do you still just oh, yeah. eagle eye, pay attention? What can I gain yeah. from this? So for every year for four or five years, uh, you know, um, Lavaline and his coach came out. And so I would sit with his coach at least one. I told myself at least it was probably more. And I was kind of being annoying a little while, but <laughs> at least now when they come out, if they still come, because they come out for less time now, I make sure that I spend the practice with them and talk mm-hmm. to him and just, well, now we'll talk about family. We'll talk about other stuff, but we'll yeah, talk you know about each other training now. and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, every time uh, an elite, coach comes out you know i try to sit with them so like hmm. a good one was Kristoff, who coached uh the world record holder um in the hammer uh from poland uh 
I forget just too many names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to sit with Christoph and I've talked to him and I try to help him out. Vestine, he brings out, you know, Daniel Stahl and those guys and oh yeah. Wow. To, you know, wow. Vestine about stuff. And and so it's just, you know, I'm always just, you know, talking to the coaches of these elite just to, you know, pick up some nuggets or I'll just watch their practice and stuff like that if I have the time. And so I always make time to make sure yeah. that I'm still a fan and even more uh, so I'm still trying to learn. And yeah. so I, you know, can always, you know, if a coach comes out, I always want to like pick mm. their brain and watch practice or do whatever it is. So a lot, a lot of humility in that, you know, at this age and stage of your career, again, this would be something that no one would blame you for. If you're like, yeah, you know, if I can, I'll make it out there. But otherwise, what, I mean, I've been doing this longer than some of those guys have. What, what do I need to learn? So there's humility there of like, uh, yeah. Let me go learn. What's what's what else can I pick up out there? But it's always check or you go at the door. I think yeah. college is hard because college, I, I feel like, teaches you have to be very protective of your group, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how you get ahead. Like you said, in college, you get coach of the year award, you get all this kind of stuff, and that's how you move up, you know, get stability and stuff like that. So you almost become a little overprotective, and you feel mm -hmm. like, you know, even though, like, let's say, you know, like, um, let's say I was working at Florida and I'm the jumps coach. Right. And, and, you know, coach Holloway is the sprint coach. I, I, you know, I become so protective of my group that even at Oklahoma, you sometimes forget to like coach Holloway, like one of the best sprint coaches. Let me go over there and just sit and watch practice mm. and talk to him a little bit. Right. And so um, I think sometimes in college you get away from that because you just, you're recruiting, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. you're doing that. And at my level, if coach Holloway comes out, I get to sit there. So Oregon was coming out. So I got to sit there and, you know, spend some time, you know, with Robert and obviously more with uh, coach Taylor, you know, Curtis. Mm -hmm. I get to talk to him. I get to watch practice. I get to see what they're doing, you know, uh -huh. and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. uh, there's those kind of nuances that I get that, you know, and, and I think it comes because I don't look at, you know, I'm being hospitable and I'm trying to, you know, whatever, I'm not the director anymore, but, Right. You know, they have to talk to me because uh, you know I'm I was the director of the program and help with that, and you know I, I try to make them feel welcome, but I also am trying to go out and you know like just watch their practices hmm. and, their practices and stuff like that. And they don't see me as a threat. I don't think they you know. <laughs> right. so. Well, catch us up, man. That's uh you know right there. You you have lived like two or three coaching <laughs> careers, my friend. Tell us about MVA training, what you're doing now. I yeah. loved your line. I, I had to write it down as a note. Uh, as, far, as far as owning your own business, you said, I'm my own boss. And you said, and that was one thing. But then what you, the three words you added after that, I thought were really essential there. You said, which is critical. That, when you talked about owning MVA and having yeah. people on your staff, that's great because healthy things grow. So you're building a company, which means people are employed. Those are great things. And you're serving athletes. So tell us about MVA training. How did it come about? What is it? Why should we pay attention to it? So I, I knew, basically, I knew that USA Track and Field was ending their program. Uh, I mean, I actually thought we were done after 12 and 16 and uh, 20, you know, just all these times. So, nine, nine lives of the cat, right? <laughs> exactly. So during COVID, I actually took an online class on how to build an online business and stuff like that. And I've had literally uh, thousands of coaches ask me questions and I've gone to clinics and do that kind of stuff. And, and there's a need for an online platform where you can get training, you can get education, you can get coaching. So basically I've uploaded a lot of talks and a lot of, you know, podcasts and, and there's literally thousands of videos of training. And then weekly I write training. So you can follow year one. Now I'm on year two of writing it. And, you know, at any time I have like 50 to 60 athletes and coaches that are following the training. And then we have like a community board that I post things to, and we have about 200 and something coaches on that. And then I have a therapist who pu puts, you know, therapy modalities for athletes and it'll grow to, um, you know, I've got a distance coach um, that will end up doing distance. We'll end up doing throws. We'll end up doing like sprints and hurdles. I mean, right now we're sprints, hurdles and, and jumps and, mm -hmm. And so it's growing that for not just, I call it the Amazon of, of hmm. online coaching. So it's a one-stop shop to be able to kind of get everything from a standpoint of uh, training, coaching, education, all that kind of stuff. And so there's just thousands of hours of videos, uh, workouts, everything like that. And, so, and, and we'll put the the link in the show notes here, but tell us the, the website again. So you can, well, mba.services. Is, yeah. is the training thing but basically like i'm also doing we do two camps we do a winter camp 
December 27 through 29 for high school kids. Um, and, you know, we allow a little bit of junior college kids like that, you know, kind of coming mm-hmm. in. And then we have a summer camp that'll be in end of June and July. And, uh, you know, I thought, wow, you know, this will, I started it late, kind of whatever. And we had, you know, 30 kids and they flew in from all over the country to come into the camp <laughs> from Virginia, Texas, all these different kind of things. So it's been kind of whatever. Every Monday, Wednesday, we have speed training, but that's my thing. I the only eight to 12 year olds. We won't do anything older than that. So we're teaching this young <laughs> generation coordination, balance, wow. multi-directional, learning how to do lifts and, and kind of thing like that. And that's all the local kids. And the great thing about it is the my athletes are working at my Olympic athletes and they get paid for it. So they have a part-time mm. job. They have some kind of things to it. So, and then uh, we have some, some little bit of technical training. We have a high jumper. So Rachel McCoy helps out with some of the high jumpers. And we also do like a plyometric explosive training. So volleyball players and some mm-hmm. athletes will come out to that. So it gives the athletes money so that they can, you know, survive and have a part-time job. I mean, it's not a lot, but you know, they make anywhere from 15 to hundred to 2000 a month, which, Mm -hmm. you know, allows them to stay in the sport and grow. Um, Then, you know, we work with international athletes. So it's got a lot of different things. So you can Mm -hmm. do the online, you can come to camps, clinics. Uh, We do, you know, more specific training. I have about four or five that, you know, pay a little bit more to do specific training with Mm -hmm. me. And then uh, we have international. So I have 10 international, nine international athletes that I work with myself and Bashir Ramsey, my assistant at the center. And then this year we had a couple of baseball guys come in so far. Uh, the football agents have reached out to me, but we just don't have the bandwidth to do that this year. Unfortunately, uh, we'll try to grow it some more, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's different sports, different spectrums. I think as track coaches, we, we, we are the best speed and agility and sprint coaches in the world. Amen. We really yeah. are. We, we, we spend so much time that we could tell you, you know, acceleration, all that kind of stuff. And I think sometimes when coaches aren't in track, they or they're kind of scared to leave the comforts of college mm. or whatever, because there is, I mean, there's nice to have a paycheck, to have pension, to have all that kind of stuff, but there's so much more money to be made. Mm. If you take a, if you take, you know, if you're in the right place too, let's put it that way. So right, I'm right. Gonna, no offense, but I'm not going to be able to do the same thing from a coaching standpoint, Muncie, Indiana, mm-hmm. right, Indiana, right, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but there is, you know, I'm seeing it more and more. I'm seeing a lot more coaches who got out of the college coaching who are doing mm-hmm. speed and agility and youth thing, and and they're doing well and they're thriving, you know. It, and so and it also sounds like, and you know, if you're watching us on YouTube, you, you maybe you picked up on this. Uh, Cause your face kind of lit up a little different too. you. You, you've, you know, over the past hour and 40 minutes here uh, some great memories, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and no greater than the day you met me in Boise. I understand that, but uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> some great memories. But, but when you described working with the eight to 12 year olds and working, uh, you know, with your assistants, Bashir uh, Ramsey and things like that, it sounds like you're having a lot of fun too. No, it, it, it's so much fun. The only thing, the only reason I say it won't be the best time of my life is I have a seven month old my first child and (laughs) for the last 10 weeks I've been dad and it's it's a new challenge and and I honestly being her dad is better than coaching a gold medalist and so I it just changed everything and so for me this avenue allows me not to have to go to 76 more countries and spend that time away and and I'm building for the future for us and so exciting uh from a standpoint that way that you know yeah she's she's gonna live a different life than i did not that we were you know broken poor but you know we didn't have everything and for me to be able to provide and 100 percent she's my legacy and that, be, that's your job as a parent make yes. it better for them than what you had it no matter and, how good or bad you had it how do you do better for them and, and mike you, you you've heard the conversations at the USTFCCA. they always thank their you know spouse for raising their kids and, mm-hmm. and i don't want to be that guy I want to be the guy who, you know, gets to pick up his daughter from school or take her to school and pick her up, whatever. And this, what I'm doing right now allows me to. And oh, man. the thing too is like, you know, I'll be, we'll be in Formia, Italy this summer and a training thing for, you know, five to six weeks and they're going to come over for a month and stuff like that. Oh, and wow. Things like that. And, and you know, we'll, I'll, depending on if the Asian games happen in China or not, uh, they'll hopefully be able to come over and stuff. So those kind of things uh, allow me and in college, you know, you, you don't have 
as much freedom from that standpoint. Right. You got to recruit, you got to do this. And, and, you know, yeah, you're gone from nine in the morning and you get home at five or six and then you got to be on the phone to talk to your kids and stuff. And I literally being where I'm at, I get to go into work about nine, nine thirty, And I'm, I won't be home at three or four because I love what I do. And I, hmm. and I probably stay a little bit longer, but if I have to, I can be there, but every night I don't have to get on the phone and talk right. to you, sit there and be dad and you know, all that. So, oh man. So, yeah. So it, it's pretty That's awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah. And, and actually we have Curtis Beach is going to come out. He's going to start <laughs> oh, yeah. out at the center. Yeah. Oh, I love him. Yeah. yeah he's a great guy. And, and I'm excited to kind of get him in the, in the fold of, NBA and, and, and that that's two pretty smart happened. people right there by the way Curtis is another <laughs> he's way one smarter guys. than I am, yeah but, uh, that dude's another you know, level. now you know the Koreans are going to come out so I got him working with some of the Koreans and stuff already and stuff like that and he's going to have some Chinese athletes to work with and so he's going to be a busy guy working with Mac Chris Mac and kind of coming over with me a little bit too good so. yeah so, yeah well man Jeremy you know I've known you for a long time and known you since you're a young and, uh, and it's just amazing to see your journey and to hear your journey. Uh, and I love that, you know, here, here's what's so interesting to me, even at, again, this age and stage of your life and what a new, uh, stage you're working into here as a parent. Oh my goodness. There is no, there is no bigger, harder, Better, frustrating, no. uh, loving yeah. <laughs> thing than there, than being yeah. parent. So, uh, so, so happy and proud of you there. Uh, but it's so interesting, you know, all the things that you've done, all the things that you've accomplished and I know you, so I know I have to say this, the things that you've helped others accomplish. I mean, you're a servant leader from the, from the drop. So, you know, all those things that you've helped other people accomplish and that you've accomplished, and it feels like, like if your story was a book, like if I were reading your story, like I might be done with chapter three, because I know there's <laughs> seven, eight, nine, you, you have such a great runway in front of you, man. It's going to be amazing to watch your daughter grow up and the, the experiences that you're going to give her. I mean, that's just fantastic. That's I mean, she, she's seven months old and she's already been to the Bahamas and she's been to 12 states. So what? there you go. And she's seven months old. <laughs> yes. Get out of here. My kids can't hear that. They'll be, uh, they'll be jealous. They'll be like, we've been like two <laughs> states, dad. What the heck? Man? Christmas, they're going to Hawaii. So there, oh, there you go. So. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. My kids have been to the bourbon trail in Kentucky. That's their like, yeah, we've been there, <laughs> but uh, it, it's just so exciting to see you know, you thriving and surviving and, and again, serving others in that, you know, with the journey, just the story continues to be written. Like I can't wait to do a five year, 10 year, 15 year checkup with you and, you know, more medals and even more importantly, you know, growing the sport and growing people's love of athleticism and what it can do for them. You know, someone's going to go to a university of Wisconsin, like you did and become a doctor because of the help that you've given them to earn scholarship or just the belief of like, wait a minute, if my coach can do it, why can't I do it? Why not me? Right. So uh, it's just amazing what you're doing for others and what you have done for others. Uh, again, that, that backside, we don't even see the things with coaching education. And uh, again, I just get this, like, you know, the, this thought of just lifelong learner and servant leader, man, that's, that to me is like, that, that's what I would th title your book so far, man. No, and I, just, I, just I, love I have a, I have a great book that I will write one day and, and I yes. have so many great nuances and, 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 um, and, you know, just been super blessed with people yeah. in my life or, you know, just experiences. So I'm going I'm to share this one thing that it will be in my book, which will be kind of funny. Yes, yes. And so and, and it kind of just keeps me, you know, the humility in my life and stuff like that. And so I always like look at it. My In seventh grade, I went to, I'm from Camarillo and it's a very kind of affluent area. I mean, it, it, it has, you know, regular middle class people, but it, there's a lot of wealthy people who live here and stuff. And so high school of over 2000 people um, and uh, you know, Mercedes Benzes and Beamers and all this kind of stuff in the parking lot. And, you know, I walked to school and we didn't, you know, we had enough, but we didn't have a lot and it was what it was. And, um, but in like sixth, seventh grade, my dad bought this huge green Oldsmobile, right. It was like old used kind of thing. And it was just a, a tank, right. The thing was a boat <laughs> and it, you know, for kids who have, a lot um you know it's it, it and not having a lot it was embarrassing it was like embarrassing to be dropped off in the car mm -hmm. and, and i was like going to school and i'd be like dad you can just drop me off here I, you know i don't want people to see me kind of, like, <laughs> I'll, you know, I'll run a mile into school just drop me off yeah, here it's all good. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was a it was a new good looking car but it was like you know this this 19th green oldsmobile it was like we called it the green monster and um 
And so at school, I'm totally embarrassed and kind of whatever. And and and, it's, and I say this as perspective and the, per, mm -hmm. the chapter will be perspective. And so I, my parents had me play like inner city sports, you know, to kind of just, you know, just, it was a good way to kind of, you know, keep ourselves, whatever. So I think it was eighth grade summer before freshman year, we play like LA city summer league. It keeps kids off the streets and everything else like that. So these kids are from LA, you know, they have, you know, they're poor, <laughs> you know, government cheese, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this big green car, I'm kind of embarrassed. And my dad's taking me and, you know, dropping me off. And I show up and my teammates are there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm embarrassed, you know, it's whatever. So I get out of the car and all my teammates go, Jeremy, that's you? Oh my God, that car is fly. That car is so dope. Oh my God, that that wow. 72, old, oh my God, it's amazing. And I get out of the car and I'm like, yeah, you know, you know how we do, you know, kind of thing. You, so you, you, you changed that story real quick, didn't exactly. you? You're like, yeah, man, that's how so, I do. <laughs> so I was such a huge poser because I sat there and I was so embarrassed. And the minute, you know, it was like, I'm out in front of my friends who think it's like the cleanest car ever. I'm like, yeah, you know, you know. And it, it's perspective. Right. And so that's how, you know, kind of I have other stories like that, but it was like perspective of, you know, it's the situation of where you're at. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's that watch thing where, you know, you, mm -hmm. your dad gives you a watch, you take it to whatever it's worth a couple of dollars. You take it to an antique shop and it's worth ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And so it was like the car. Yeah. You know, in Camarillo where people don't appreciate things and are materialistic it was embarrassing. But when I went to someone who had nothing, it was an amazing car. And so mm -hmm. that's the perspective I've kind of been able to carry in my life is the fact of, yes, I can coach medalist. I can be this kind of thing or whatever else like that. But are you a good human? Are you giving back? Mm -hmm. Are you, you know, kind of whatever, what's your, are you, are you keeping in perspective the fact that you're doing the most you can as a coach and as a provider and, and stuff and as a teacher and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's, that's the uh, chapter that we're kind of, you know, all right about perspective so well i tell you what my friend knowing you for as long as i have you are a good human and you as, as much experience as you've had as much perspective as you certainly have you about to get yeah see now i'm a, I'm a dad and i'm a dad of two kids I, I get to give these like old man exactly dad. you can, you can like, help me it's on like, this one uh, oh no there, no no there is no help there there's your there's your only line there is no help uh you know she's seven months old so yeah you messed up 16 months ago uh for any help that you could have had man. it's uh, it's over you, you're done for uh but you're about to get some perspective being yeah. dad and being dad to daughter my my first uh kid was a son and then my second one's a daughter and oh my goodness it's amazing how different they can be and yeah. how they tug on your strings and frustrate the ever living out of you all unique ways so she um owns me already, oh yeah so. oh yeah yeah that's they, they joke me. about that but it's that's like one of those things that's like oh yeah no that's that's kind of real that's that actually does kind of hand like, like when she's with mom she doesn't cry if she's put down she just kind of whatever but if i'm around and she's put down when <laughs> it's like what i did it to myself <laughs> oh man jeremy man thank you so much no, uh what a blast me. this is uh, so cool. fun you're kicking off season four here with us last week we had the great dan path this week jeremy fisher it's gonna be hard to follow you two uh whoever the next one is gonna be like oh thanks thanks for helping letting me follow these two guys <laughs> so um but just so thankful for you man so thankful for our friendship um and honestly thankful for not the things that people can easily see that you've done, you know, the, the coaching will and Brittany, you know, two amazing human beings on their own, right. Uh, you know, what you did at OU and Northridge, th that's, that's great. And that's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, but honestly, for a guy like me who, you know, my bread and butter, my, my, my livelihood, not my livelihood, but my, my passion was the coaching education side, knowing what you did. We, we, we touched 1% of what you've done on that level. I'm just so thankful for that. That's something that happens and has to happen that some people don't realize someone has to actually sit down in the chair and write and someone has to actually teach and the preparation that it takes to teach. So just that whole body of work at such a young age, my friend, uh, just so thankful, man. So grateful for what you do for all of us in track and field and uh, what you do for your family. It's, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. I'm just so, so grateful for you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me and and definitely and look forward to seeing you down the road so awesome absolutely my friend Thanks well thank you share my story <laughs> uh, anytime man. anytime you want to come back and do a part two you want to do like a five-year-old checkup with her we'll, we'll talk about how that's been getting oh, then you sure. start school that's it's it never stops man it never, <laughs> it never stops, stops. Well, this never stops here at the Gill Connections podcast. Again, just so grateful that you choose to listen to us. I, I say it ad nauseum. I know and it's on purpose. I know the Gill Connections podcast is not 
an easy podcast to listen to. This is not a 20 minute chunk. This is not a, this ain't even a one hour podcast. This is call it two hours every week with just amazing human beings. And the reason we do them for this long is because these guys and gals deserve it. Their story is not a 20 minute segment. Their story is not an hour segment. Heck, we touch kind of surface level in two hours. And so uh, I'm just thankful that you come every week and listen to these amazing journeys. Uh, Their story matters. And I hope you are challenged. I hope you are encouraged by what they have gone through, what they go through, and what they continue to do for our sport. So join us next week when we pick another coach out of the hat, see who comes onto the show and uplift and honor their journey. Have a great week, everybody.